Greetings, everyone. My name is Serenity Tedesco, and I'm grateful to be in your company today. My research is titled The Art of Suffering, Anger Through uh, Liberation Through Anger and Radical Honesty. The Buddha's first noble truth states life is suffering. Existence is bondage to bodily experiences of emotion, excrement, illness, pain, and death. Dharmic spirituality posits this reality of suffering as inherent to our very being. The importance of this teaching is apparent in its scriptural placement. It is the Buddha's first noble truth in the first line of the Samkhya Karaka. Suffering would not exist without feeling. Feeling is how we experience suffering. Emotion is in the very fabric of this human reality of suffering. Evidence of this suffering is, is observable in our life by simply witnessing our fluctuating mind and by stepping out into society. In this paper, I draw attention to anger and its associated emotions, including grief, shame, and fear. Manifestations of anger are all around us. We see it in war as organized anger. There's divine anger from God that smites sinners for their wrongdoings. We see it in mass shootings, sexual violence, environmental destruction, political unrest, white supremacy, systemic oppression, and murder of unarmed black men and women. There was a nationwide collective eruption of anger after the murder of George Floyd in the summer of 2020. This was expressed through strident demands for social justice, protests, riots, and militarized police force to suppress them. Anger is present in our interpersonal dynamics with family, colleagues, friends, roommates, and partners. The potential for misunderstandings, triggers, and expressions of anger increases in groups. Then there's the anger we feel that we feel within ourselves. Frustration arises from being unhappy in a matrix world full of rage, suffering, and uncertainty. We experience self-loathing, trauma, unmet desires, disappointment, and judgment within and there's much to be angry about. We have a complicated and confusing relationship with anger. Humanity sits at two extremes, indulgence of aggressive anger in violence and hatred or fear of it through denial, disassociation and bypass. So what do we do with anger? This quote describes the spiritual speaker's plight with it. I'm angry at anger, I hate it. I want to get rid of it. I want to be free from it. I want it to never again take me over and use my body, speech, and mind to harm myself and others. But hating it puts me in a double bind. If I get furious with my anger, it does take me over. To stop anger, I can't be angry. If I stop getting angry, no matter what, I attain the goal. But if I'm not angry with anger, will I after all get back into it? Spirituality is sold as a solution to discomfort, anger, and sadness. It promises to eliminate suffering in the mind, body, soul for a permanent state of peace, love, and happiness. Seekers run away from life's problems towards spirituality for this solace. Practitioners from all faith traditions are motivated to cultivate a sense of goodness within themselves, unlike what is apparent in the human environment. As a result, anger is often repressed, avoided, and shamed by spiritual culture in a world full of rage. Heron presents an obvious problem, a less obvious problem. Spirituality itself is used to bypass the angry human experience. Spiritual bypass is defined as the tendency to avoid or prematurely transcend basic human needs, feelings, and developmental tasks by John Wellwood. Modern spiritual culture and technological advances have also influenced anger suppression. For example, woke is trendy. Woke is slang terminology to describe elevated awareness. A person that is woke is an individual that knows the truth. Woke is short for awake, as in I was sleeping and now I'm awake. However, work's popularity is not an indication of collective enlightenment. The appearance of knowing has become the newest fashion. It does not necessarily mean that the people who are woke have become awakened beings. This appearance of knowing or being woke is quite accessible in the information age where the highest end teachings of spiritual traditions are available with a series of key words and a click of a button. For example, we learn in Mahayana Buddhism that everything is emptiness. But what does this teaching mean if we haven't realized it? The combination of being woke and the information age has resulted in the ego that is inflated on the identity of being spiritual. 
Anger suppression is a symptom of the spiritual ego that seemingly knows everything, tries its best to be a good person, and asserts power through delusion and confident ignorance. The rise of good vibes only culture is an outcome of the spiritual ego sustained by neoliberal capitalism and concealed white supremacy. Yoga brands profit from white consumer comfort. Moral outrage or justified anger of people of color are often met with defensive white pushback as white fragility and suppressive scolding disguised as spiritual teachings. In addition, the Orientalist romanticization of the peaceful yogi image was fabricated by British colonizers to oppress terrifying warrior sadhus. Lastly, there's typically no personalized guidance for lay disciples in modernity unless one has the privilege of time and resources to build an intimate relationship with a guru. All of these reasons created an insidious effect of spirituality used as bypass for humans and experiences deemed as negative. In this paper, I propose that anger itself is a spiritual path toward liberation. I argue for an alternative perspective of anger and its experience beyond the binaries of right and wrong, rejection and indulgence. There is a middle way of understanding anger without judgmental labels of good or bad. Anger, like pranayama and asana, is a tool with effects determined by the wisdom, intention and actions of its wielder. Anger is a transformative force. It has the potential to serve as this form of svadhyaya self-study to achieve self-realization. My research asks the following question, how can anger become a vehicle for liberation? The taboo rejection of anger does not negate its existence. We need fire to light up the darkness, to warm us, to cook our meals, to fuel our passions and to love. I answer this question with, with a series of additional questions in a story-like narrative for reflective investigation. So to answer my research question, we might first begin by asking, what is anger? In the Christian and Islamic West, anger is one of the seven deadly sins. In the Buddhist yogic East, anger, dvesha, is an addiction, klesha. It is one of the three root poisons, visha, along with greed and delusion. It is considered a samskara. Anger is one of the causes and conditions of samsara, the cycles of death and rebirth. His Holiness the Dalai Lama categorizes emotions into two, positive or negative, with anger belonging to both. The positive emotion of anger is motivated by compassion for all sentient beings with an outcome of positive change. The motivation for anger that is negative is actually hatred and the outcome is destructive action. Chandra Rinpoche employs the word anger synonymously with emotional suffering. As we see here, gross expressions include rage, irritation, frustration, criticism, cynicism, and so forth. Subtle expressions of anger include sadness, fear, grief, anxiety, restlessness, doubt, and passivity. The gross negative expression of anger is what we're most, most familiar with and imagine in association with anger. But we often experience emotion in simultaneous layers. We can feel anxiety in the midst of our happiest moments on our wedding day. We can feel guilt, shame, and satisfaction biting into a chocolate cake. We can feel deep grief underneath a protective layer of rage. Another way to examine anger is through the philosophical and scholarly positions on it which are normally divided in two. One, anger is bad, and second, anger is normal or good. The East and West divisions melt away in anger rhetoric. Philosophers and theologians from diverse backgrounds offer credible arguments for both sides. More questions come to mind. Who is allowed to be angry? Society has provided specific unspoken parameters for who is allowed to be angry. Historically, it's been whoever's been at the top of a hierarchy the dominant white male patriarchy, governments, the wealthy, and the divine. God is able to smite people, but we are not. The opposite is also true. Whoever's at the bottom of the hierarchy are the only ones allowed to be angry, not the privileged. We have many notions of who's allowed to be angry and who is not. We have countless justifications for those who are angry and reasons for why they shouldn't be. But in order to know if you are allowed to be angry, we must ask, who am I? This is also confusing. 
society, spirituality, and personal experience offer different answers to this question. Power, privilege, and oppression are often the parameters of permissibility in anger expression. I'll use myself as an example. At the center here, you'll see my current physical form in the material manifest world. Beside it are the labels I subscribe to. I'm an immigrant and an American. I am heteronormative and a minority in the United States. I am a student and a scholar. There are many qualities within this single body that contradict one another on the spectrum of social hierarchy. One can observe quickly that I hold positions of power, privilege, and oppression in my identity narrative. And I am not alone. Everyone sits at the intersection of privilege, power, and oppression. Context matters. Dependent on where I am, I hold different sets of privileges and oppression. And we are not a single level label, nor are we the collection of our labels. We are fluid beings at the convergence of polar opposites. In this investigation of anger, we must continue to ask more questions. Who are we angry with and why? What makes us so sure about our position on anger? Who and what are we protecting? As Chandra Rinpoche states, it never occurs to us to say beyond the English alphabets of M and E, what is it that you're actually looking at? There's a supposition that there's something there. In Buddhism, there is nothing there. There's only emptiness. And if there's only emptiness behind the constructed concept of self, we can say this, anger arises from clinging to our labels, stories, and forms. Anger is not a position, but it is a fluid and cyclical experience like the changing of the seasons. Anger is an impediment to happiness, but avoiding anger is an obstacle to liberation. We must experience anger to genuinely transcend it. But in truth, no one actually knows the answers to these questions, including myself. Spirituality and religion offer us beautiful possibilities regarding the truth of who we are and the nature of reality, but there's no way to really confirm it with the limitations with our five senses and ever-changing thoughts. As non-liberated beings, we do not know the depth of our ignorance. We are ignorant on the ultimate nature of reality. We do not know what anger is. We seek liberation without truly knowing its causes and conditions. We often reach for answers through stories and assumptions of who we are, what the world is like, and what we're experiencing. It is our fixation, grasping, and rejection of these stories, whether true or false, that often determine our emotional experience of them. These stories and all material manifestations are bound to change under the fundamental truths of impermanence and emptiness. So we must ask, what is liberation? No one wants to suffer and everyone wants happiness, but liberation is not simply bliss or freedom. If anger arises from our stories and presuppositions, liberation is not the cessation of anger, but rather the cessation of the stories we believe to be true. We achieve liberation by living, liberating the world, others and ourselves from our stories, projections, assumptions, and appearances. The self-cherishing ego mind must dissolve and free itself from the world. Anger burns through this delusion and ignites transformation towards our liberation. Here we see an example of a wrathful deity. The divine expresses, expresses compassionate wrath as a form of bodhicitta and enlightenment. Wrathful Buddhas take on terrifying forms in order to subdue the most tenacious, deeply rooted and powerful inner and outer demons, which are ignorance, greed, delusion, and the ego. According to Rob Linroth, the sensual and fierce imagery represents poison as its own antidote, harnessed obstacles as the liberating force, and notes that they are metaphors for the internal yogic processes to gain enlightenment. The answer to the question, am I allowed to be angry, remains unclear. External sources, society, religion, mentors, cannot be the only determinant element of experience during this precious human birth. Perhaps the better questions to ask are, will you allow yourself to be angry? Will you be radically honest about your earthly feelings and ignorance? Will you study your raw emotions and let it transform you? 
the path through anger emerges through the constant questioning of the way things are, pursuing wisdom, and utilizing discernment as sadhana or daily practice. Anger as a vehicle for liberation is a twofold path that acknowledges and actively engages with society and individual spiritual commitment to free all sentient beings from suffering that arises from within and without. Spiritual practitioners renounce and actively reject the systems and structures that cause suffering to our sentient beings and our mother earth. Liberation is discovered by internally sacrificing our ego and its stories into the spiritual fire as described in the Vedas. As the ego enters its funeral pyre, we can watch the flames erupt, observe it with non-judgment, allow the timbers and forms to break down and be with it until the embers die out and turn into ash in time. We must be willing to die repeatedly in our waking life to be reborn into wisdom. Ego death requires the melting of forms, views, stories, and self-image. It often takes the power of anger to release the grip of the stubborn ego. The potentiality of our liberation is strengthened through practice and resilience. Our ability to get back up after each death and continue the spiritual path. Over time, we gain knowledge of the terrain and its obstacles. We fall less frequently and rise swiftly with more ease. Stepping into the flames may be painful, scary, and even humbling. And yet, the flames also illuminate the path towards our spiritual awakening. It keeps us warm in the chill of indifference and disassociation. It is fire that burns through all things, forms, appearances, stories and illusions into the ground and sprouts new life. Love is at the end of the tunnel. Once one accepts and enters the path of anger towards liberation, uncertainty sets in as deep darkness. Much of this paper and life itself has felt like crawling through this dark tunnel, feeling my way with my hands and emotions towards a glimmer of light at the end of the path. The truth is, that life is uncertain and that uncertainty terrifies us. We seek solace in the comfort of spirituality through refuge and faith in something greater, hoping it will resolve all of life's problems and the deep feelings of profound suffering. There is an inner child within all of us that wishes to be told how to end the pain of existence through guidance by what to believe and feel. So how long that process, we lose ourselves in dogma and the potential of eternal happiness that our hearts long for so badly. We are all feeling our way through a dark tunnel, tremulously listening for a voice that would reassure us on our path. Yet the voice is not outside of us. The voice is unheard. There is only resounding silence. However, it is not hopeless. The infinite potential of emptiness exists in our imagination to create something new and meaningful. We can choose the stories that give purpose to our lives by listening to the feeling heart. We can embody existence fully and allow it to be our home in the uncertainty of being. We can choose to feel what is genuinely within us, including our anger. We can choose to forgive and to love. The Buddha himself was a non-liberated human among all of us who found liberation in a world of ignorance, suffering, and anger. We all have the potential to be liberated in the dark night of our inner being. And that is what the pain of suffering gifts us, uncertainty and the ability to love in the darkness. We seek a light outside of us to show us the way, only to discover that the light of wisdom has been within us all along. Thank you all for listening. We're very much appreciating the work that Serenity has um, has presented us, and we have a few minutes for questions. What I would like to begin 
with a question in regard to what we learned in comparative mysticism, which is the dark soul of the night, the agony of confronting the shadow side of one's personhood. And what Serenity did so eloquently this evening was to draw those linkages and acknowledge that there's a great deal of hatred that simmers underneath what may seem to be a serene experience. And I wanna to look to her for some practical advice about locating that and then what to do about it. Thank you for your question. Um, I'm also sad that my slides didn't show. I hope that one day you will all be able to see them. Um, but to answer your question, I think identifying anger is a challenge for most of us, especially those of us that are deeply sensitive and found spirituality as a means to overcome this feeling of anger that we see all around us. I think it comes by turning off the cognitive mind. And I think there are many different ways one can do that. It can come through simply allowing the body to move and embody the emotion of anger. It can come through shouting. It can come through dislodging the emotion through these physical means that force us to turn off the cognitive mind and fully embody the emotion that is anger. And then what to do with it. Um, in my paper, I actually suggest many different practices to overcome anger or even discover your own anger, depending on what your disposition is. I think it depends on where you come from. Um, there are a couple of mind tricks. One of the things that I like to suggest in my paper is the observation effect. Um, by one, simply imagining an observer watching, for example, a wrathful deity watching, one can change their own behavior. And this is actually found in quantum mechanics as well. Um, another practice that I really enjoy to kind of tame anger that arises within us is a practice that I call the uh, moment between stimulus and response. If we take a second to pause in that moment between stimulus and response, we often find that we have a choice in how we react to things. And in that moment, we can bring in that observer effect I just mentioned. If we, for example, imagine that there is our loved one or Jesus is watching us in the moments right before we get angry on the road, we might actually realize, oh, I do have a choice. I don't have to act impulsively. And it gives that moment of self-reflection. Um, I can keep going on. I do have many pages of practices that I talk about, and I'm happy to share that with anyone who is interested. Um, if I may, I saw Judith had a question earlier. Do you still have one? So I think Chris pretty much asked mine. I mean, I, when you started, I was really, you started um, aligning this with Buddhist tradition. And I was reminded by that story of, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, Shish, Shishupala, who um, had such an intense hatred of Vishnu through many incarnations that it, it became um, this absorption on Vishnu that eventually led to liberation. So it's just another story and from a different part of the whole tr Dharmic tradition of this anger, this hatred leading to liberation. And so I can't wait for you to um, give us access to your thesis so we can look in detail at some of the methods that you suggest, the practices for, it's so appropriate for this time, mm. handling these all these feelings that um, at times feel so at odds with other things that we're trying to achieve. So I really then want to just say, I thank you then for looking at this topic so nicely. I really appreciate your words and you bringing up that story. It's such a profound concept that one can hate God so much that God is in the mind so deeply that one can achieve liberation. 
it sounds so counterintuitive, but at the same time, that's the power of hatred and anger sometimes. It has this ability to emerge and be so present in our lives that we cannot ignore it. And perhaps we can harness that power in a different way. And that is what I'm hoping that this um, anger paper will provide. I'm open to any other questions if anybody has. Is there any yogic exercise to control anger? A yogic exercise? Yes, hmm. this is a yoga question. So is there any yogic exercise to control anger? Yes, for sure. So my definition of yoga is, of course, very encompassing of all the Dharma traditions. So what I would actually say to answer your question is remembering the Heart Sutra. That's something that has really been effective for me. The Heart Sutra, kind of like the Samkhya Karma, goes through all material manifestations and identifies what is not us. We are not our mind, we are not our body, everything is emptiness. And in the realization that everything in this manifest world is emptiness, we realize how, even for my reasons of anger, even this feeling of anger, although it may seem so justified and makes so much sense in my head, it's not actually real. And not to say that all stories aren't real. You know, they, I think there are many stories that are really important for us to acknowledge, such as the story of systemic oppression. That is very real. Um, and we respond very differently to that story. But oftentimes the kind of resentment and the residue that we feel in our heart comes from these stories that we create in our mind and are not necessarily a reflection of the truth. Um, another thing I'd like to add, and I don't know if this is necessarily a practice, but I like to remember what samsara means. What does karma mean? The fact that we've been reborn for so many lifetimes means that everyone that we encounter has been our father, mother, brother, or sister. But this also means that we were once all per perpetrators as well at some point. We were criminals. We were rapists. We were the people that we would consider to be bad. And when we remember how we were close and had distance with other people, we can have a lot more empathy for those who in this lifetime are expressing themselves as perpetrators or loved ones. 